there's one thing that Hayek says in this chapter 10 on, about the wars getting to the top that I think uh, might be a bit of a contradiction. He says, I'll read the quote. He says, socialism can be put into practice only by methods which most socialists disapprove, uh, end quote. And I think he's, uh, he's talking there about uh, the mass violence, the killing of, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany and, and so forth. Uh, but this seems to me, this uh, conflicts with what he says later, that a collectivist must do anything uh, to pursue his ideology of the ends justify the means. That's one of the characteristics of a collectivist and a planner uh, that Hayek says right in the same chapter, uh, that they believe that the ends justify the means. And he points that out as one of the chief distinguishing differences between individualism and collectivism. Individualists don't believe that the any ends justify uh, justify the means. And it seems to me that this is a bit of a contradiction because a lot of socialists in the 20th century certainly did go along with uh, uh, anything, any method to achieve uh, to achieve their goal, no matter how seedy and how immoral. And of course, the, his, his arguments on why the, uh, the worst rise to the top uh, uh, should remind you all of today, of what's going on today. If you uh, read about, uh, you know, reason number one was that uh, it appeals to the, the least educated people in the population, uh, not because they're necessarily uh, easy to dupe, but because uh, more educated people tend to have more differentiated tastes and preferences, and therefore uh, they're less susceptible to go along with one uniform plan for all of society. That's the argument he makes. And of course, the docile and gullible, his words, uh, will be easy to dupe. And uh, the third thing he mentions is that it's always easier for governments to get people, a lot of people, the masses, to go along and attack an enemy, uh, something negative, rather than uh, supporting a positive program to do something positive, to, uh, to get the people stirred up and fearful of an enemy. And he talks about how uh, in Europe, of course, of his time, uh, the Jews were, were seen as uh, proxies for capitalists. And so uh, the attack on the Jews, Hayek says, was largely uh, an attack on capitalism. They were the symbol of capitalism in the minds of uh, Hitler and, and some of the other Nazis and, and, the, and the Italian fascists. And uh, this brought to mind a, a, pa a, a little discussion in a book by Thomas Sowell, uh, named uh, called uh, Knowledge and Decisions. And uh, Knowledge and Decisions is an application of the Hayekian knowledge problem to all sorts of issues in society, crime, national defense, uh, and so forth. But in one passage in Knowledge and Decisions, uh, Sowell talks about uh, what happened, uh, the origins of the, uh, the plight of the European Jews in the 19th and early 20th century. And he talks about how uh, there was an original wave of discrimination where the Europe, a lot of the European Jews were prohibited by laws, by governments, from participating in certain industries. And it so happened, Sowell says, that so, some of the in industries that they were permitted by law to, to uh, participate in were middleman industries, like banking and insurance. And uh, so the, what, what this led to was because of the ignorance of capitalism and the ignorance of the important role of middlemen in putting buyers and sellers together. After all, markets don't work automatically. Uh, we need we need middlemen and middlewomen to put buyers and sellers together. I guess the real estate agent would be the quintessential middleman institution, so for, so called. Uh, a grocery store is a middleman institution. It puts uh, consumers. It's a middleman between consumers and farmers, for example. Uh, but but since so-called middlemen don't actually produce anything, they move. They facilitate the movement of goods between buyers and sellers, but they don't actually produce anything. They've always been easy targets for socialist propagandists. And so Sowell's explanation for the origins of the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, plight of the European Jews was that uh, they were first kicked out of uh, a lot of manufacturing. And then they excelled at being middlemen in banking insurance. And that it turned, tended to be a curse, according to Seoul, because they had the, the anti-capitalist animus uh, was especially uh, hardened toward those groups, toward bankers, insurance companies, and other, other sorts of middlemen institutions that the Jews in Europe excelled at. And uh, 
this is a debatable or you know uh, theory on on Seoul's part, but it seems to make economic sense to me that that that, that exacerbated uh, the problem of discrimination against the European Jews, which was mostly uh, discrimination against capitalism uh, first and foremost, according to uh, Hayek, as far as that's concerned. And so that's an interesting twist I thought I would bring up. And another, another of the highlights of this chapter is how um, Hayek explains that um, socialism always inevitably leads to nationalism. And the reason why that, that he gives is that, remember, under socialism or collectivism, it's not the individual that is important. It's not the individual and his or her achievements that are important, but it's, it's, it's your membership in some sort of collective that is important, such as a nation. And so that's his argument for why uh, socialism always ends up in some sort of nationalism. And of course, another reason he gives, uh, uh, well, not, not him, but uh, other, other reasons have been given for this. Uh, Murray Rothbard, for example, uh, uh, discussed this in one of his publications that I'm going to mention uh, shortly. And, and he makes the case that uh, the European wars in Europe uh, until the 20th century, uh, until the 19th century, really, were mostly uh, conflicts between rulers. Yeah, the rulers, the kings, uh, would have their own armies, and there would be a dispute between two of the countries. There were mostly disputes between the rulers and the ruling class and their supporters, and they left the, the average uh, person mostly out of it. They may have paid some taxes for, for the wars uh, throughout European history, but they were mostly left alone. But nationalism was used more recently to get the masses involved and make the wars their wars and not just the dispute between the King of England and the King of Spain, for example. And so that's, that's Rothbard's uh, explanation, one of them for, uh, for nationalism, the rise of nationalism. Um, another important point that Hayek makes here in this chapter on the worst rising to the, to the top is uh, when he, he talks about an essential ingredient here of this is that uh, uh, there's a veneration of centralized governmental power. Okay, veneration of centralized governmental power. And that has always been true. Lord Acton, the great British uh, philosopher of freedom, historian of freedom, I wrote about this. And what I thought I'd do is, since I, I've written about this in a, in a lot of different places, about uh, centralization versus decentralization, and since we're talking about the road to serfdom, published in 1944, Hayek, Nazi Germany. Uh, I thought I'd bring uh, Hitler's own words into it in, uh, uh, in his, uh, his uh, worshipful words about centralized versus decentralized government power. And this is taken from uh, the 1999 Houghton Mifflin edition of Mein Kampf, uh, where Hitler, Adolf Hitler himself said this, the individual states of the American Union, he's talking about American history, could not have possessed any state sovereignty of their own, for it was not these states that formed the Union. On the contrary, it was the Union which formed a great part of the so-called states." End quote. That was Adolf Hitler. What he's doing here is he's paraphrasing Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, where he said the same thing. Here's what Lincoln said. The Union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed, in fact, by the Articles of Association in 1774. It was matured and continued by the Declaration of Independence, by the Articles of Confederation, and establishing the Constitution. It follows from these views that no state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the Union. And so I'm not saying Lincoln was just like Hitler, but I'm saying Lincoln certainly was an advocate of centralized governmental power. And, uh, and, and uh, men who are much more evil than him uh, used his words to justify their centralization of power. Uh, Hitler, <clears throat> Hitler, in the same book, mocked what he called the so-called sovereign states in Germany with their impotence and fragmentation. And he praised uh, Bismarck for all but eliminating state sovereignty during his time in, in the late 19th century. Um, Hitler wrote this. I'll keep on reading. Uh, the power of the central state, this is in Germany, is threatened by the struggle between federalism and centralization so shrewdly propagated by the Jews. And so here's his anti-Jewish uh, uh, rhetoric, claiming that the champions of decentralized government, states' rights, federalism, was a conspiracy of the Jews uh, in, the, in, the, in Mein Kampf. Uh, 
And he goes on, uh, thus a rule basic for us national socialists is derived, a powerful national Reich in a, in a central Reich, centralized Reich. And he made the inevitability, inevitability argument. He said uh, uh, the power was inevitable. That certainly all the states in the world are moving toward a certain unification in their inner organization. And in this, Germany will be no exception. So he made the argument that Hayek is talking about that that it's inevitable. Centralized governmental power is inevitable. Uh, one final quote I'll mention here from, uh, from Hitler. Uh, the National Socialists, Nazis, moreover would totally eliminate states' rights altogether, since for us the state as such is only a form, but the essential is its content, the nation, the people. It is clear that everything else must be subordinated to its sovereign interests. And so there's right from the horse's mouth uh, uh, what Hayek is talking about here when he talks about the uh, totalitarian tyrants of venerating centralized governmental power. Uh, that's about as good an example as I can uh, think of. And, uh, and of course, in a lot of my writings, I've, I've criticized a lot of contemporary advocates of centralized governmental power, and I'm not saying they're just like Adolf Hitler, but that is putting us down the road to serfdom. Uh, when I, I debated some years ago uh, over one of my Lincoln books, um, Harry Jaffa, the, um, the Lincoln scholar, and during the Q&A uh, at the Independent Institute in California, in Oakland, California, uh, the subject of 9-11 came up. This was in May of 2002 that this happened. And, uh, and he said that 9-11 uh, uh, proved uh, more than ever that we need a, a powerful central government. And uh, my response is that it proved more than ever that the central government is even incapable of defending its own military headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, but but uh, Jaffa and, and a lot of other uh, neoconservatives, uh, of course, are champions of centralized power, just like a lot of leftists are, because they want to use that monopoly political power for their own ends. Um, Another thing that uh, Hayek mentions here that I, I thought I'd update to today's world is when he talks about how uh, once the worst rise to the top and it's easy to, uh, to uh, recruit uh, the less educated, the more gullible, and so forth. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are a lot of job opportunities for these people. He says, uh, in his words, there are job opportunities for, quote, the ruthless and unscrupulous. And this brings me to today. Um, there's an excellent article written by Robert Higgs, who I've mentioned several times in this course, uh, entitled, Why This Gigantic Intelligent Apparatus? Question mark. It was in uh, The Beacon, published by the Independent Institute, and Lou Rockwell reprinted it on uh, lourockwell.com recently. It's about a Washington Post story about the type of uh, so-called intelligence apparatus that has exploded in and around Washington, D.C. since 9-11. And I'll read to you um, just a couple of the, uh, the, the uh, facts that are pointed out here. Now, this is from the Washington Post. The top secret world the government created in response to the terrorist attacks of September 11th has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much money it costs, how many people it employs, how many programs exist, etc., and it says some 1,271 government organizations, these are new since 01, 1,931 private companies work on programs related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence. Uh, an estimated 854,000 people, nearly one and a half times as many as live in Washington, D.C., hold top secret security clearances in, in this whole big new industry. In Washington and the surrounding area, 33 building complexes for top secret intelligence work are under construction or have been built since 2001. And this is just based on information that the government decided to give, to give up, to make public. I think it's a good bet that it's much, much bigger than that. And so in response to 9-11, we've, we've had this creation of this gigantic so-called intelligence bureaucracy of basically spies spying on us. They're not, they're not spying on any enemies or potential enemies. They're spying on us uh, here, here in the U.S. Uh, and that's that's the point uh, Hayek is making about how uh, the unscrupulous will will gather around uh, this sort of totalitarian uh, project. 
And he certainly uh, was right about that. Um, and in the discussion of the end of truth, um, this is why I put the article by Murray Rothbard uh, on the reading list, the discussion of the end of truth uh, as, a, as a feature of totalitarianism or the road to totalitarianism. And uh, it's an important article. It's one of, I think it's one of the most important articles that Murray Rothbard ever wrote. It's not the most widely read, I don't think, uh, as far as Rothbard's work, he, he wrote so much. But, but this is a really, really insightful article in the, uh, the operations of the state. And one of the, key, uh, one of the key things that he mentions here is the point that in any state, even the former Soviet Union, uh, the rulers are still a minority, a numerical minority of the group. And so how do they gather support, uh, whether it's a, a democracy that is headed toward tyranny or a, a dictatorship, how do they get their support? Uh, well, the f vested economic interest is easy. Bureaucrats, government employees, uh, people who get government grants and, and so forth, but that's still a minority of the population. How do they get the masses to not necessarily be supportive, but to acquiesce and not revolt? That's all they need to do. They just need to avoid a revolt, a bloody revolution. They don't need to get the masses to believe in them and support them actively, but just to not overthrow them. How do they do that? That's where the role of the intellectuals uh, comes in, the court historians. The state needs the intellectuals. Uh, and as Murray Rothbard put it, the intellectual's livelihood in the free market is never too secure. And so the state can offer security, money, prestige, and, and so forth. And uh, it's worth quoting uh, Rothbard a little bit here. He says, a, a, a venerable institution, furthermore, is the official or court historian dedicated to purveying the ruler's views of their own and their predecessor's actions. And I'm sure all of you can think of incidents that you've read about or learned about in your lifetimes uh, of uh, court historians twisting the truth about, uh, I've been doing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, writing myself in my books on Lincoln and Hamilton among other things in my book, How Capitalism Saved America, as well. Uh, and what do these court historians do? Uh, well, they try to por portray the state and its rulers as great and wise men. If any of you are uh, aficionados of biographies, uh, political biographies, uh, you can learn, learn a lot by reading biographies written by historians. But uh, most of them, in my view, most of them are hagiographies in that uh, they'll take whether it's Lincoln or FDR or Henry Clay or whoever, and uh, they'll, they'll idolize them. They'll make them out to be big, big heroes for the most part. Uh, of course, that's not true if you have me or, or a Murray Rothbard or a Tom Woods writing ab about these figures, but the history profession, the American history profession in general, which is what I'm uh, mostly familiar with, I think that's certainly true of them. Uh, I'll give you one example um, of uh, the best uh, biography that I know of, of the American politician, Henry Clay. Uh, uh, Clay was a walking disaster his whole political career, you know, one thing after another. He was the moving force behind America getting involved in the War of 1812 with Great Britain. How does Robert Remini, his, his preeminent biographer, deal with this? Well, he tells the story of how Clay was the chief agitator for war with Great Britain in 1812. And then the war turned out to be a calamity. The British burned down the White House in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Clay was one of a dozen or so people who participated in negotiating the treaty to end the war. And so uh, Remedy heaps high praise on what a, a skilled uh, uh, politician he was in, in uh, crafting the peace treaty. Uh, Clay was the... Uh, the sponsor of the terrible tariff of abominations in 1828 that raised the average tariff rate on imports to uh, nearly 50%, uh, almost caused a civil war at the time. Remini does the same thing. Clay participated in negotiating the treaty that ended, uh, that reduced the, the tariff rates. And uh, so he's, trades, he's praised as a great statesman, even though the whole mess was his fault in the first place. He was the sponsor of the legislation. And, and I see this in, in most political biographies that are written by American historians. That's why they always list when they have the rankings of the presidents, uh, you know, the big government guys. It's always FDR, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt. They're always at the top. 
Okay. Um, what else do these court historians uh, do? Well, as Rothbard said, the greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism. So independent criticism must be washed away. It must be whitewashed away. And uh, there's no better way to stifle that criticism than constant attacks on, on the dissenters. And that is uh, certainly, certainly what the court historians do. And so uh, I hope you have a chance to read this entire article. It's really insightful about how the state works. And it, and it fits in perfectly with what Hayek is talking about in this, uh, in this particular chapter. Uh, another important point uh, that Hayek makes is that in order to maintain power and maintain their positions at the top, uh, the worst, as he calls them, must create myth after myth after myth uh, to justify their actions. The myth of the, uh, the benevolent and omniscient and uh, savior state, and also the myth of the evil civil society, the evil capitalist regime, and so forth. And uh, some of the examples uh, that I would mention, uh, as, as a lot of you know, I've, I've written a lot about uh, the Lincoln myth. And uh, I'd like to mention just one thing here. So I've written several books and a lot of articles. But there's a, a book that was published last year uh, in, by a, an author named Larry Tagg, T-A-G-G, -G, entitled The Unpopular Mr. Lincoln. And the subtitle is The Story of America's Most Reviled President. And uh, what Larry Tagg does is he uses primary sources to uh, discuss how it was that during his own lifetime, Abraham Lincoln really was reviled and hated in an extreme way by, by most of his constituents, all of the so-called great men of his time on both sides of the Atlantic. And I'll read you one thing that it says in the, the dust cover of this book. Uh, Larry Tagg says, the violence of the criticism aimed at Lincoln by the great men of his time on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line is startling. The breadth and depth of the spectacular prejudice against him is often shocking for its cruelty, intensity, and unrelenting vigor. The plain truth is that Mr. Lincoln was deeply reviled by many who knew him personally and by hundreds of thousands who only knew of him. And so, of course, you know, after Lincoln was assassinated, he became a saint. And part of the story that Larry Tagg tells is how this happened. How did a person that in his lifetime, and this is not by Southerners in the United States, this is by his own constituents in the Northern states and by Europeans, was hated and reviled. How did that turn into the beloved saintly Abraham Lincoln? Uh, well, Larry Tagg talks about how it was essentially the project of the Republican Party and the Northern uh, state clergy who were linked in with the Republican Party in a big way who essentially rewrote American history, starting as soon as Lincoln died, pretty much. And so the myth of the, the, uh, the benevolent, saintly Abraham Lincoln was, uh, was created. Uh, another one of the very, very big myths in American history, uh, and every country, every government has a set of myths like this, uh, is the, the myth of Herbert Hoover, President Herbert Hoover, who supposedly was an advocate of laissez-faire and uh, his policies of laissez-faire, free market capitalism, led to the Great Depression. Uh, in truth, it's not hard to find out what Herbert Hoover did as president. Uh, he was a big spender. His uh, so-called stimulus program uh, created a deficit that was 13% of GDP, which is more than double of what Obama's deficit is as a percentage of GDP. It didn't work, of course. Uh, he was a big tax increaser. He started up many of the programs that the New Deal just continued on, like farm boards, paying farmers to not grow food, to try to prop up the price of food. That was a, that was a Herbert Hoover program. He started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which put the government involved in allocating capital. It socialized capital markets in a big way. Uh, the, the RFC, it was called. Uh, he, he pressured businesses to raise wages during the Depression. He didn't pass, get legislation passed. FDR did that. But Herbert Hoover uh, would strong arm. He would call business leaders and executives into his office and, and implore them to raise wages. And of course, whenever the, the government uh, calls a business person in uh, to negotiate over something, it's always a gun under the table negotiation. 
you know, the, the, the implied meaning is do this or we will pass a law forcing you to do this, which they eventually did during the Roosevelt administration. And that caused even higher unemployment by raising wages when demand for workers was going down uh, when, once the Great Depression uh, was started. And so uh, even in my book, How Capitalism Saved America, I, uh, I quote uh, uh, FDR's top economic advisor, Rexford Tugwell, as saying that uh, they owe a, a great debt of gratitude to uh, Herbert Hoover because much of what they did was just to codify in law the things that he had already got started. So that's another big myth. And of course, the biggest myth of all is uh, that FDR uh, got us out of the Great Depression. Uh, he didn't, as I mentioned before in the course, the, the rate of unemployment by the late 30s was still in the 14, 15% range, uh, <clears throat> whereas it was only 2.9% in 1929 on the eve of the Great Depression. And so that's another big myth that uh, we still participate in, as well as the myth of Keynesianism that we're all living today in America and elsewhere around the world, the idea that the government can make us rich by taking our money and spending it for us. Uh, of course, if that was ever true, uh, we could all get rich by simply sending all of our paychecks to the, na the national capital and have them send them back to us at 120% or 150% of what we originally sent them. But that's the myth of, uh, of Keynesianism. And so, uh, you know, these and, and many other myths uh, are at the heart of uh, what keeps governments in power. <clears throat> Another thing that Hayek mentions that I thought I would add to here is on page 179 of The Road to Serfdom, I'll read uh, what he says here, 179. Uh, near the top, he says, quote, there is no real freedom of thought in our society, so it is said, because the opinions and tastes of the masses are shaped by propaganda, by advertising. And this is 1944, he's writing this. And uh, Hayek is also, um, among economists like me, is well known for a short little article that he wrote in 1961, which is on the web. It's called The Non Sequitur of the Dependence Effect. Non Sequitur, just two words, uh, Grayson. Second word is S E Q U I T U R. It means uh, does not follow logically by Friedrich Hayek. It was in the Southern Economic Journal in April of 1961. And it addresses this very question because at the time, um, the, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith had sold hundreds of thousands of copies of, of several books that are all about this so-called dependence effect. And basically what the dependence effect uh, uh, does or says is that much of the money that we spend, we as consumers, uh, is wasted because we spend it on things that uh, are not innate or inherent wants. There are, there are things that are put into our heads by advertisers. We don't really want or need these things. Uh, therefore, it's a waste of money. And money would be better spent, Galbraith went on to say, by taxing us more heavily and spending that money on things that he thinks we should spend the money on, uh, you know, government projects and so forth. And so uh, this is what Hayek is talking about here. And Hayek's famous response uh, to this is to point out that this is a very old ar ar argument. Uh, he says it's for well over 100 years, socialists had been making the argument that uh, the problem of production has been solved. We know how to produce stuff. We know how to produce things. Therefore, the only real issue, the socialists said, is distribution. Who is to get what? And so uh, this, of course, is ridiculous. Uh, the, them saying this in the 1940s and 50s, when, uh, when there was still you know, poverty around the world was still much more, much worse than it is um, today because of the lack of capitalism and, and freedom. Uh, but that was their argument. And so what Hayek says is, well, this uh, uh, Galbraith's argument is just the latest rendition of this old argument that the distribution of goods is 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 uh, not right. That we should uh, we should ignore the uh, the production side of it. And here's what Hayek said. This is kind of a cute phrase. He says, he says, uh, now keep in mind, Galbraith's argument is that it's only the innate wants and desires that are important, things that, are, that come out of our own minds. If we spend money on those things, that's fine. But if we spend money on things that are brought to our attention by advertisers, not good. Here's what Hayek said. The innate wants are probably confined to food, shelter, and sex. 
All the rest we learn to desire because we see others enjoying various things. To say that a desire is not important because it is not innate is to say that the whole cultural achievement of man is not important. End quote. And that would include the books of John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, you didn't think of them, I didn't think of them, he did. His publisher and their advertising firm brought them to our attention. Uh, the public schools, Hayek used the example of public education. You know, what does public education do, Hayek said? It, it tries to instill an appreciation for literature in the minds of, uh, of students. Uh, why is that? Well, because literature is not in their minds. They have to be, it has to be brought to their attention. Uh, uh, and that's true of, of just about everything. And so Hayek goes on to say that uh, all, the cultural, all the cultural achievements of Western civilization, uh, the works of Shakespeare, would have to be judged as useless and irrelevant because, after all, Shakespeare thought of them. You and I didn't think of them. And so he just turns this into a reductio ad absurdum, uh, and, and he does it very effectively in just about two or three pages in this, uh, in this article. Okay, and so uh, and that's what Hayek is talking about. And the final, I might as well read the part of the final paragraph of this article on uh, uh, the, uh, the non sequitur of the dependence effect of, of what Galbraith is up to. He says, what he's up to is, quote, the use of coercion to make people employ their income for purposes of which he approves. It is not to be denied that there is some originality in this latest version of the old socialist argument. For over a hundred years, we've been exhorted to embrace socialism because it would give us more goods. But since it has so lamentably failed to achieve this where it has been tried, we are now urged to adopt it because more goods, after all, are not important. And so I think Hayek really had Galbraith's number here, as the saying goes, and, and really did a devastating job of, uh, of criticizing him. Okay. So that's the dependence effect. And if you look at the, uh, the third chapter uh, for tonight, uh, chapter 12, The Socialist Roots of Nazism, Hayek has written about this in earlier chapters of how the, the Nazis all started out, and other fascists, and Mussolini and the rest, started out as, as socialists. Uh, uh, one important point in this chapter, I think, is you know, one of the most important points, is how he discusses how World War I was viewed by the German public, German intellectuals, uh, who were used as court historians, as a war between liberalism and socialism. And this is something that I mentioned before uh, when I talked about nationalism and the views of Rothbard and, and Hayek with regard to the importance of using nationalism to get the masses stirred up for war. Well, the, the, uh, the German intellectuals who were in all, every one of them, uh, on the payroll of the German government, uh, they got uh, the idea in the minds of the public that this was uh, a war with uh, liberalism, with the ideas of freedom and capitalism and commerce and, 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 and mutually advantageous trade and versus socialism, uh, which was being championed by the intellectuals in Germany. And that's how they got the, uh, the, many of the masses, much of the masses on board here. And uh, another comment that Hayek makes here is that the socialists said that World War I was, was, quote, the realization of a socialist society. And this is very, very telling, the realization of a socialist society, because the same thing was said in America at the time. And there's a very interesting uh, lineage to this, this idea that uh, World War I was the realization of socialism. Uh, many of the American intellectuals who made this argument were educated in Germany. In the late 19th, mid and, eight, and late 19th century, uh, the economics profession in particular, uh, most of the economists were trained in Germany. There wasn't much of an American economic profession uh, in, at, that, at that time. And one of the most uh, famous is uh, Richard T. Ely, E-L-Y, who was uh, the co-founder of the American Economic Association which is the big trade association of, of economists, has been since, I think, 1885. He went to Germany, was, a, was a, a, a studied in Heidelberg, and he came back and he taught at Johns Hopkins for many years. And, um, and so he, this, the spread of these ideas came from Germany to the United States. And so when Hayek talks about socialists saying that World War I was a realization of a socialist society, uh, 
the same thing was being said in America. And I will refer you to another article by Rothbard that is on the web, on the Mises uh, website, where he discusses this uh, very in great detail. Uh, the article is entitled World War I as Fulfillment. The subtitle is Power and the Intellectuals. And uh, this was a part of a symposium about the book Crisis and Leviathan by Robert Higgs. And I think uh, I'd like to read to you the, some of the first page of this essay by Rothbard. It's, it's, from, it's published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, Volume 9, uh, Winter of 1989. And here is, here's uh, Rothbard. I am convinced that the war, he's talking about World War I, came to the, to the United States as the fulfillment, the culm culmination, the variable apotheosis of progressivism in American life. Um, those of you who have been watching Glenn Beck you know, uh, on the Fox News channel uh, know that uh, he's been ranting and raving against the progressives. Well, Murray Rothbard here is talking about the so-called progressive movement in politics in America, which was basically the uh, well, left-wing interventionist movement of the first two decades of the 20th century. He goes on to say this. This is Murray Rothbard. I regard progressivism as basically a movement on behalf of big government in all walks of the economy and society in a fusion or coalition between various groups of big businessmen led by the House of Morgan and rising groups of technocratic and statist intellectuals. So that was the coalition. In this fusion, the values and interests of both groups would be pursued through government. So you've got the intellectuals, status intellectuals, the would-be government bureaucrats, and big business. Big business would be able to use the government to cartelize the economy, restrict competition, and regulate production and prices. That's what they wanted. So they, they joined in with the progressives. And to continue the quote, and also to be able to wield a militaristic and imperialistic foreign policy to force open markets abroad and apply the sword of the state to protect foreign investments. Intellectuals would be able to use the government to restrict entry into their professions and to assume jobs in big government to apologize for and to help plan and staff government operations. Both groups also believe that in this fusion, the big state could be used to harmonize and interpret the national interests, so-called, in quotations, and thereby provide a middle way between the extremes of dog-eat-dog, -dog, laissez-faire, and the bitter conflicts of proletarian Marxism. And uh, that's a mouthful. That's the first paragraph of this article by Murray Rothbard, but I think it, it really explains in a nutshell uh, what the progressives were up to. And then he goes on to say, World War I brought the fulfillment of all these trends, all these progressive trends. And what were these trends? Militarism, conscription, massive intervention at home and abroad, a collectivized war economy, all came about because of World War I. And Rothbard goes on in this essay to cite specific individuals who were all for World War I, although almost invariably they were exempted themselves. They didn't go themselves. They're like uh, the neoconservative chicken hawks today that uh, want us to invade pretty much every, country, every other country in the world, uh, sometimes it seems, although they have never been in the military and, and usually none of their children have either, as, as far as that's concerned. Uh, and these are the, the today's progressives in that regard. And so they, they looked at the central, and because at wartime, the governments are centrally a plan. They command and control. They nationalize industries. They impose price controls. They commandeer resources. The progressives were all for this. They wanted to use the war as a demonstration project that socialism could work. And, uh, and so, so that after the war was over, they did their best to keep all this going. And uh, if any of you are at all familiar with Robert Higgs's uh, great classic, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, he writes about this in World War I in some detail in that book. But uh, a lot of these things that did occur, the militarism, the nationalization of industries and so forth, uh, a lot of it was abandoned after World War I, but not all of it. And so we still uh, were much more statist after the war than we were before the war, as, as, as is invariably the case. And so uh, I would urge you uh, to read this article. I'm not going to put a quiz question on it since it wasn't on the reading list, but, but it struck me after, uh, just recently that this would be a, a perfect article to read 
in, uh, in combination with this chapter 12, the socialist roots of Nazism, because the, the, it's the, the progressivist roots of, uh, of interventionism in America is pretty much the same thing. Okay, I see uh, Billy Beru said he wrote a paper on this in his senior year, the progressive era. He's given away his age. Um, well, it's, I have 7.44 on my clock, and I think that's about all I was going to say about these three chapters as far as my take and my, uh, my uh, contribution to uh, interpreting what Hayek is really saying here. And uh, so I'll, um, if it's okay with Grayson and the rest of you, I'll, I'll go on and start answering the questions. And I've, I've printed out the questions just a few minutes before I came up here uh, to start the class. Okay, um, so that's what I'll do. Uh, question by Maureen Bader. The Austrian business cycle theory says booms and busts are caused by central bank policies. How does it explain booms and busts in the U.S. prior to 1913, the year the Federal Reserve was created? Well, uh, we had central banking in America uh, before the Fed. It just wasn't called the Fed. The first central bank was the Bank of the United States, uh, 1791, and it created 72% inflation in its first five years. And, uh, and as a result of the uh, economic catastrophe it created, it had a 20-year charter that was not renewed. And then the War of 1812 came, and uh, the Bank of the United States was brought back to, uh, to monetize the debt, to pay the war debt from, world, from the War of 1812. Uh, the Bank of the United States, which was a precursor of the Fed, uh, went back into business in January of 1817. Murray Rothbard's doctor, doctoral dissertation at Columbia uh, which is now published as a book published by the Mises Institute, is called The Panic of 1819. So the first Fed, the Bank of the United States, came back into existence. Uh, it was called the Second Bank of the United States at that time, and it created a boom and bust cycle immediately. And within two years, there was the Panic of 1819, and for the first time in American history, uh, people witnessed uh, large-scale unemployment in the cities. And in, in, uh, in, uh, Philadelphia, <clears throat> in Philadelphia, the... Uh, employment in small manufacturers, which is sort of hand tools and things like that. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was dramatic, dramatic reduction, something like a 75% increase in unemployment uh, in one year at that time. So they created the panic of 1819. So there were panics and boom and bust created by central banking uh, uh, before the Fed. And not only that, the government has always intervened to some degree, also periodically, uh, the government uh, would, uh, state governments and the central government would uh, suspend specie payment. They would pass laws saying that the banks no longer had to, uh, to uh, give uh, gold or silver back in return for the currency that they had issued. And this was often used to, um, to finance wars. And I'll blow my own horn a little bit. Uh, I wrote an article that was published in the American Conservative magazine, uh, the last issue. Uh, on, it's entitled War and Inflation. And uh, so it's online on the American Conservative website and Lou Rockwell also uh, reprinted it on lourockwell.com uh, a week or two ago. And, uh, and one of the things I talk about in the article is the history of how to finance all the various wars, even before the Fed, uh, governments passed laws uh, allowing uh, bank creation to take place at a faster pace and uh, mandating that banks do not uh, back up their currency with gold or silver as a way of of monetizing the debt that was rung up uh, to pay for the wars, the government's wars. And so you don't need necessarily the Fed per se to have government intervention in banking. We've had all sorts of regulations on banks also that have, that have interfered in, in the free market, uh, you know, in addition to the things that I've mentioned. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, we've had boom and bust created by governmental intervention before the Fed was created. Even the Fed itself has a publication called The Structure and Functions of the Federal Reserve System uh, that calls the Bank of the United States uh, the first central bank and calls Alexander Hamilton, who was uh, the, the originator, it was his idea to have the Bank of the United States. The Fed calls him the founding father of central banking in America. So this happened a long time ago. Uh, next question, uh, 
Last week, you mentioned James Buchanan's idea of political externalities. This is David Peterson. Could you recommend a few specific articles by Buchanan that speak to this idea directly? Uh, one article I can think of that's very easy to read and explains uh, Buchanan's position on this. Uh, the title was something like Market Failure and Government Failure, and I know it was in the Cato Journal in 1988, uh, and you can get it on cato.org uh, and, and look it up there. And uh, James M, middle initial M is in Mother Buchanan, and uh, uh, something like market failure and government failure. And, it's, uh, and I think uh, the journal editor asked him to explain his basic uh, uh, way of thinking about this. And that's what I was referring to. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's a question by Michael Brewer. Uh, Hayek seems pretty squishy about the welfare state. <laughs> How would Rothbard at, at all, I'm not sure who at all are, comment on his rationalizations in this regard. So yeah, how do I think? I, I know you aren't in touch with the other side. Huh? Well, I have no idea what the other side is uh, on him in this question. But uh, yeah, he was squishy about the welfare state. He, he said uh, he, he advocated social insurance. He said it would be okay uh, to have social insurance, which is what uh, the welfare state has always been, been called. Uh, uh, Rothbard was a natural rights theorist, and he, he believed that this was an act, uh, to tax people for such a thing would be an act of aggression and an act of theft. And so on those grounds, he, he, was, he was against it. Uh, but Hayek uh, was more the utilitarian, and he, and he, and he was for uh, the minimal state, including uh, the welfare state. Okay, um, at some points in chapter 9, I thought he, Hayek, was justifying something close to Obamacare. Well. No one knows what Obamacare is. It was several thousand pages of small print written by lobbyists for the most part. And even that will be interpreted by regulatory agencies. All the laws that the U.S. Congress passes uh, are enforced by the bureaucracy. They're not enforced by Congress. So even Congress doesn't know what this law is going to do because the bureaucrats will enforce them and adopt policies uh, that implement all these, these laws. And so... Uh, but, but in general, yeah, he, he does refer to sort of the state involvement in health care uh, there. But I don't think uh, he'd have no way of knowing what Obamacare was. Uh, okay, the, the next thing is just a, a, a statement. Next question by Dennis Foster. In Chapter 7, Hayek stated that the claim that a planned economy would produce uh, substantially larger output than the competitive system is being progressively abandoned by most students of the problem, end quote. Yet the massive health care reform bill was passed in no small part based on exactly this thesis that a planned system would lower costs for the same output. Uh, was Hayek too optimistic? Well, as you know, in, in the first chapter, Hayek says uh, he's not a pessimist. He's, he's writing the book because he hopes that these ideas can be used to, to, to stop this sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, people who get into politics, most people get into politics, get into politics because they have some sort of compulsion to order other people around, to rule over other people, to, to, to control their lives, to tell them how to behave. And, uh, and, and so what we have in the United States and most other uh, countries of the world today is several hundred years of accumulated levers of power the bureaucracy and the laws and the IRS and the tax code. And so the people you get in power now, whether it's Bush or Obama or, or anybody else, they gain control of uh, 230 some years of accumulated levers of power, and they can do a lot of horrible things with these levers of power. And that's the situation we're in, uh, we're in now. And so, uh, uh, and they don't care about these intellectual arguments. They care about power and controlling us. That's what they're they're into. They they totally ignore this. Of course, it's it's an outrage. You know, we we haven't really studied in that much detail Hayek's participation in the famous uh, socialist calculation debates, but his 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 contribution uh, for the most part is considered to be the knowledge problem. When I had you read his article, the use of knowledge in society, that was that's probably the most famous expression of his his ideas on why socialism uh, would never work. There's more to it than that. Ludwig von Mises uh, was a, also equally important and, and is a contributor to that whole big debate in the early 20th century. But, uh, but this, this debate uh, 
was won so decisively by Hayek and Mises that one of their antagonists, um, the late Robert Heilbronner, who uh, wrote a book called The Worldly Philosophers that was used in economics classes for generations. He wrote an article in the New Yorker magazine around 1990 or 91. Uh, I think it was entitled Mises Was Right. Mises Was Right About Socialism because that's when you know the whole socialist world had collapsed. Uh, Heilbrunner actually got it wrong of what Mises said about why socialism was collapsed in that particular article. But it was a, an admission by one of the most uh, well-known socialist intellectuals in, in America and the world, Robert Heilbrunner, that, that Mises was right. But then uh, at the end of this particular article, he goes on to say, uh, but we shouldn't give up. We should now uh, uh, advocate socialism in the name of environmentalism. So, so and, and that told me when I read that, that, uh, well, Hal Brunner was like all other statists. He's only interested, interested in in the power to rule over other people, to, to order them around, to push us around, tell us how to live, to, to steal our money and spend it in ways that he wants to use it, not in ways that we would like to use our own hard-earned money. And so, uh, and so Obama is no different, uh, and neither are the neocons who run the Republican Party for that matter. They're, they're pretty much all the same gang. Uh, they just want to spend the money in, in slightly different ways than, uh, than the Obamas do, uh, as far as that's concerned. So um, I, don't, I can't say if Hayek was too optimistic or not. You know, this could all fail. This could all blow up in, in Obama's face. Uh, we could nullify and repeal uh, socialized medicine. Uh, we, we could even have a breakup of the American Union, just like the breakup of the Soviet Union. I'm still optimistic about, about that. Uh, next question by Roger Tutant. On May 25th, 1998, Senator Barack Obama told those attending the Wesleyan University commencement that our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. And because thinking only about yourself, fulfilling your immediate wants and needs, betrays a poverty of ambition. Uh, then in, in chapter 10, Hayek says, once you admit that the individual is merely a means to serve the ends of the higher entity called society or the nation, most of these features of totalitarian regimes which horrify us follow of necessity. The question is, at what point on the road of serfdom does it become practically impossible to make a U-turn? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've, I've, that's been on the news recently, Obama's statement about collective salvation. That's not a new idea. It's been around a long, long time. In fact, this article that I mentioned by Murray Rothbard, World War I as Fulfillment, Power in the Intellectuals, uh, he writes here and he's written elsewhere about uh, a religious fanaticism that was a part of the progressive movement. These were uh, uh, part of the post-millennialist uh, tradition in America. These are people who had a radical form of post-millennialism who believed that in order for themselves to be saved and go to heaven, that they had to first create a perfect world, a heaven on earth, uh, with what they called a thousand-year kingdom of God on earth. And how were they to do that? Well, they were to stamp out all forms of sin, such as uh, alcohol consumption, the Catholic Church was, <laughs> was one of the earlier types of sin that, that needed to be, to be stamped out. And uh, they were they were pietists. They believed in using the powers of government to create a sin-free society. They, they, so that's why, like I said, these were these people were crazy, uh, and uh, and so and they wanted to bring this internationally. Uh, they, they thought that they could stamp out sin not only in America but in Europe as well. And then that's part of the argument they made for uh, American entry into World War II. It's our duty to stamp out sin around the world. These are all the ideological sons and daughters of Abraham Lincoln. This was the same ideology that was, uh, as Murray Rothbard points out, that was born in around the 1830s in New England. And, and, and the Yankees, the New England Yankees, uh, that's who these people were. They, these people had these religious beliefs. Uh, and that's why they were so zealous in, in some of the things that they did. And so, uh, and, and so by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, uh, you had the same tradition. Uh, existing out there, and so uh, and so this that was a form of collective salvation. That's the same sort of thing that uh, Obama is talking about. But he would probably say uh, we need to redistribute more income and nationalize health care and, and raise taxes to uh, so we can collectively save more people than just ourselves. And so uh, so there you have it. Uh, Rothbard discusses this in this World War One as fulfillment article. 
He also has an essay entitled Two Just Wars, 1775 and 1861, that's in the Mises Institute book, The Costs of War, and it's also online. And, uh, and he discusses this same uh, pietism and post-millennialism uh, there as well, and, and as well as a few other places. And so I don't know, I don't believe it's impossible to make a U-turn uh, because I, I, I see examples in the world. We have the example of the breakup of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was at least as a powerful, a centralized state as America is today, and, and it broke up. And so, uh, uh, and it, I, unfortunately, it usually uh, needs a, a major financial crisis, which we certainly are on the road to right now before something like this uh, usually happens. Next question by Mary Sodergren. Can I clarify three quotes from the chapter? Okay, quote number one is, collectivism on a world scale seems to be unthinkable, except in the service of a small ruling elite. This is a Hayek quote. It would certainly raise not only technical, but above all moral problems, which none of our socialists are willing to face, end quote. Uh, well, yes, Hayek doesn't really go into detail on this, but I, I suspect what he's talking about is the moral problems would be the, the, the massive coercion that a single state would have to impose on many, many millions of people in order to have some sort of uh, uh, international ruling elite uh, as far as that goes. And so there are the moral problems of enslaving the population to, uh, to go along with your plan in England is, is not nearly as severe as if you had all of Europe uh, enslaved and, and being uh, such as with the European Union, for example. Uh, and so uh, I, think, I think that's what he's talking about here. Uh, the, the amount of coercion will be orders of magnitude bigger than if it was just socialism was just thought of as being on a national basis. Second quote, collectivism on a world scale seems to be unthinkable Except in this, no, well, that's for, I already read that. Oh, sorry about that. Indeed, the very concepts of humanity and therefore of any form of internationalism are entirely products of the individualist view of man, and there can be no place for them in a collectivist system of thought. I think what Hayek is talking about here is the international division of labor and the cooperation among individual human beings internationally. That's what, that's what we do. Uh, there was a wonderful article that Lou Rockwell wrote on lourockwell.com shortly after 9-11-2001 about what all those people in the World Trade Centers in, in New York City were doing uh, with the, the Citibank and all these banking uh, interests and money interests in, in, the, in New York City and the World Trade Center towers. Well, there were essentially, there were thousands and thousands of financial middlemen. And one example uh, I think that Lou gave was... Uh, um, here I am in Auburn, Alabama. I go online and I'm shopping for a, an, a, 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 an oriental carpet for my home. And I go online and I find a carpet uh, manufactured in India that it looks just beautiful and it's a good price. So I buy it from a merchant in India. What are these people in the World Trade Center doing? They're clearing my credit card purchase so that the man in India gets my money and I get his, his rug. And so uh, I think that's what uh, Hayek is talking about, is the international division of labor and the human cooperation that goes on uh, through commerce. He's, I don't think he's talking here about it, the United Nations or anything, anything of that sort. And of course, uh, under collectivism, uh, we, have, we have central planning. We have an interference with uh, the international division of labor. And we have the superseding of the individual plans, my plan to buy the rug from India, with the plans of the planners, of the government planners being superimposed and coerced and, and forced on all of us. I think that's what Hayek is talking about here. Uh, the third question, the definitely antagonistic attitude which most planners take toward internationalism is further explained by the fact that in the existing world, all outside contacts of a group, of a group are obstacles to their effectively planning the sphere in which they can attempt it. It is therefore no accident that as the editor of one of the most comprehensive collective studies on planning has discovered to his chagrin, most planners are militant nationalists. Well, in, in Hayek's day, most of the socialist planners were also uh, militant protectionists. Uh, international trade interfered with their planning. 
they wanted to plan everything domestically. And of course, they have no control. If a business wanted to buy something from America that is based in Germany, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't control that unless they had protectionist laws that would, that would prohibit the importation of goods from America to Germany, let's say. And so uh, I think that's what he's talking about, such things as protectionism. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that's why a lot of Nazi Germany uh, have practiced what's called economic autarky. And that's spelled A-U-T-A-R-K-Y, where they attempted uh, economic dependence, uh, the non-importation of goods from, from abroad. And of course, that, that reverses the benefits of the International Division of Labor and uh, made Germany that much poorer. But I'm pretty sure that's what Hayek is referring to here. Uh, next question. Um, in middle of the road policy leads to socialism. Mises argues that the introduction of a minimum wage above the market would lead to mass unemployment. And I'll, I'll skipping along here. But, uh, when such a wage, however, was re introduced in Great Britain, well, Great Britain, by the way, introduced uh, minimum wage laws in the 1920s, the low pay commission found that although the rate at which uh, new low pay jobs was reduced, no large scale dismissal of employees occurred. Well, I don't know the facts, so I can't answer the question. The question, uh, the low pay commission sounds like uh, a labor union front to me. Uh, labor unions have always been in favor of uh, minimum wage laws because they price out of work, they price out of the market uh, uh, labor that is not unionized. Uh, for example, uh, if I want to have my house painted and I have a unionized house painter who, because he has 10 years experience, he belongs to the union, he's a skilled painter, he charges $20 an hour. Or I can hire two Auburn University students who put up a sign and say, we're painting houses for the summer and I pay them $10 an hour each. Uh, well, I'm indifferent. I can, I can have, I can have, and let's say I can get the same job done by hiring two uh, Auburn students at $10 an hour each. Uh, and the, the professional painter, since he's a professional, can paint twice as fast, and he's $20 an hour. Then the government passes a law saying, I must pay the two Auburn University students $15 an hour. Well, now they're priced out of a job. I can get the professional unionized painter for $20 an hour, but the two Auburn University students cost me $30 an hour. That's why labor unions are in favor of raising the minimum wage because no one who belongs to a union works for minimum wage. It's only to price out of the market uh, competing labor. And so uh, that's what I suspect the so-called low pay commission is. And besides, there have been hundreds and I would probably guess thousands of academic journal articles over the past 50 or 60 years that show that the effect of the minimum wage law is to price low-skilled low workers out of jobs. And that's, that's the purpose of the law. Also, it's not just the effect, it always was the purpose of the law by the political coalition that was behind the minimum wage law. And there may have been a lot of people who are ignorant of economics or duped into supporting it because they don't understand the economics of it. Uh, but another point also is if, you know, if, if say if uh, these uh, Auburn University students can get a job at the mall here locally making $8 an hour, it doesn't really matter that the minimum wage goes from, say, Six fifty to seven fifty, they're already making eight dollars an hour, and so uh, I don't know the details of the question. It depends on how how much the minimum wage went up in England uh, to have an effect. If it didn't have an effect, it might have been that type of situation. But the the intent of the minimum wage is is has uh, in the eyes of labor unions has always been to price out non union labor, and it's also been the effect. Okay. Um, I might, I don't think I'm, I might have mentioned this article before, but uh, since we're on the minimum wage, uh, Thomas Rostisi, article on the minimum wage, Cato Journal, 1985. Uh, it's a good, good article on the origins of the American uh, minimum wage law and who was, bef who was behind it, the political uh, movement behind it. Let's see, what do I have here? Next question I have here. Uh, This is also Dennis, uh, I'm losing my, losing my place here. Okay, 
This is uh, on page 162, Hayek emphasizes the natural trend toward nationalism. Today we seem to see a major trend towards one world government, e.g. world legal opinions over the Constitution. I think this is referring to the fact that some of the American Supreme Court justices have used in their uh, writings, in, in, in their statements, their decisions, uh, laws from other countries, not just the not United States law. Uh, how do you think Hayek might rewrite, rewrite that section today? Uh, well, nationalism, uh, uh, well, certainly he would incorporate this. He, that's why he wrote Law, Legislation, and Liberty. He wanted to expand the ideas that he, that he uh, uh, just touched upon in the road to serfdom. And so he spent 30 years researching and writing about these things and put them into a three-volume book, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. And he would do the same thing today, I guess. But I can't guess how, uh, how he would write, rewrite that, uh, that section today. Uh, what's Gladstone's liberalism? Well, uh, British liberalism, uh, Gladstone's era, uh, free trade, free markets, classical liberalism. That's all, the, that's all that means. Uh, in Anthony Flew's article, he mentions Procrustean's. Uh, a Procrustean is a uh, an arbitrary standard that is forced on someone. So that's uh, that's what a Procrustean is. Uh, next question by Robert Broda. Murray Rothbard in Anatomy of the State uses conspiracy theories as an example of causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. And the question is, doesn't it depend on the on on what the conspiracy theory is? I consider the conspiracy theory of the U.S. government as a hidden actor on 9/11 to be harmful to the liberty movement. Uh, well, yeah, if, uh, there there are conspiracy theories uh, that say the Martians landed in New Mexico in the 1950s and the government has conspired to cover up the truth that there are, there are Martians living among us. Uh, but uh, we also have laws outlawing conspiracies, the antitrust laws. Out, the exact language of the Sherman Antitrust Act is uh, conspiracies in restraint of trade. Uh, most of what goes on in government is a conspiracy between government and various special interests against uh, the rest of us. Uh, go to Washington, D.C. and have breakfast at any restaurant in the city in the morning and eavesdrop on the conversations around you, and inevitably you'll hear people plotting the arguments they're going to use in front of this staff, uh, congressional staff member or that congressional staff member uh, that day to, uh, to make the case for their particular scheme to rob the U.S. Treasury uh, as a representative of some interest group. And so, yeah, there are conspiracies everywhere. And so uh, uh, that's an important point. Uh, he doesn't mean wild, crazy conspiracy theories involving Martians or uh, uh, an inside job in 9-11, there's, there's plenty to look into. It's just called special interest politics because uh, another thing, uh, Hayek mentions over and over again in The Road to Serfdom, the use of the language about the common good, the common interest, the national interest. Uh, the whole trick of, of, uh, of political tyranny is to try to fool the people into thinking that what is really in the, the special interest of the state itself and its political supporters is really in your interest, is really in the public's interest, it's in the national interest, the common good. And that's the role of the court historians and the intellectuals who support the state is to pull the wool over the eyes of the public. And that, that's why it's so important to study economics and, and, and political economy and the, and the work of the type Murray Rothbard is involved, was involved in uh, to help yourself as a citizen to see through these things. You don't have, in fact, uh, I get emails all the time from people bouncing all kinds of conspiracy theories off me. And I always tell them that the more economics you learn, uh, the less susceptible you will be to believing in these weird conspiracy theories. Because what makes a conspiracy theory, a, a good conspiracy theory, is there might be a grain of truth in, in a little part of it. And so, uh, and, and the, cons the people who put out these theories tend to try to make it seem as though everything about the theory is true because one part might be based on a true fact. But uh, that's one of the things economics has, uh, can do for you. Uh, when I've, I gave a talk in New York City several months ago about my book called Hamilton's Curse, 
about the uh, sort of the, who is really the real founding father of big government in America, the people in the audience uh, seem to know all about conspiracy theories about uh, since they're New Yorkers and Hamilton was a New Yorker about Hamilton was supposedly conspiring with this or that group. He was he was in bed with these European bankers and all these things that, uh, you know, I've run across these theories somewhere before, but they didn't know anything about economics. If I would try to explain them the basic economics of what I was talking about that evening, uh, no one seemed to know much about it. And uh, it's sort of a, uh, what happens is it's easy to rely on conspiracy theories uh, and it's a little bit harder to actually educate yourself in economics. But that's not what Rothbard is saying. He's not saying believe in any old conspiracy theory. Uh, most of what government does is a conspiracy against the public, uh, especially an unrestrained government like we have in the United States today. It's no longer restrained by the government in any, uh, or the Constitution in any, any meaningful way. Uh, not that it ever was that strongly constrained. Uh, let's see. I think I've covered all the questions that I have in uh, in my hand here. Let me read over the chat since we still have some time. Uh, see if I have any, or enter a new question if you have a new question you'd like to, to pose. Let's see. Let's see. No more questions. Let's see. Maureen says, but we did have a central bank here in Canada until 1935, but we did have booms and busts. I'm not an expert on Canadian uh, banking history, but uh, one of the things I know about American banking history is that we had different types of interventions, as I mentioned, without a central bank long before, even without the Bank of the United States or the Fed, we had the suspension of specie payment. And governments do tend, politicians do tend to copy each other. Once one figures out a good scheme for getting away with murder, uh, so to speak, uh, other politicians around the world will will catch on and will copy it. And so, uh, but I, I've never really studied in any detail the Canadian banking system, so I, I can't really answer that. But where I would look, uh, uh, if there is a, if there is a treatise on the Canadian banking history, uh, I would look for uh, incidents of suspension of specie payment that allowed banks through fractional reserve banking uh, to, to expand, uh, expand the money supply. Let's see, can I, can I speak to the so-called business plot against FDR? Uh, probably not. The business plot against FDR, uh, uh, much of what FDR did was, was uh, in favor of big business. The first New Deal was uh, government imposed price floors that propped up the price uh, or attempted to prop up the price of hundreds and hundreds of manufactured goods and farm goods. And so even though FDR used the horrible anti-business, anti-capitalist rhetoric for the, for the sake of the public, what he did in the first uh, New Deal uh, was uh, legalize price fixing. In fact, they suspended the antitrust laws in the, in the first New Deal to allow this price fixing to take place. And then, uh, you know, uh, coalitions are never permanent in politics, in a democracy. And so by the time you get to 1936, you have the second New Deal and the labor unions had the upper hand politically. So you had a lot of legislation that favored labor unions and was harmful to the businesses that were unionized uh, because the, the political cycle is never identical. Uh, labor unions got their act together politically and became much more influential by that time. And so, uh, so that's what in the sex of so the second New Deal, you had the Social Security the union, pro-union legislation, minimum wage legislation, maximum hour legislation, and, and so forth that primarily benefited unions at the expense of non-union workers primarily, and also at the expense of some businesses. And so, uh, so even though FDR had a lot of anti-business rhetoric, he wasn't quite as anti-business as you think, uh, just as Obama is not. Uh, who do you think finances the Democrat Party as well as the Republican Party with the big bucks? It's uh, the big business people on Wall Street and elsewhere. Let's see. Let's see. Vinny, we versus they, negative element, and Hayek wrote about uh, would, 
would the illegal immigration issue fall into that category? Uh, I'm not sure what we versus they is. Uh, uh, I think Hayek would, would have been, he would probably be an open borders guy if he was here uh, today. Although a lot of uh, well-known uh, free market economists like Milton Friedman, Walter Williams, Thomas Sowell, Gary Becker are opposed to open borders uh, as long as there exists a welfare state. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I really can't guess on what Hayek would say today about, about that. Can I comment on the news today of England rethinking its health care plan because, because it has failed? Well, it's been failing for a long, long time. Um, there's an old book. If you want to read something about nationalized health care, there's an old book on the British national health care system by John C. Goodman, spelled good man, in one, you know, one word. It was published in the 1970s. And it was an excellent expose about how the national health care uh, worked about as well as socialism works anywhere. Uh, perpetual shortages, uh, bad quality uh, service, uh, the brain drain because of underpaid doctors. Who, so they fled Britain and went elsewhere to America and, and other places where they could earn a decent living as a physician. Uh, that's been going on for a long, long time, and the government of England has been subsidizing and subsidizing it and propagandizing about it. But it's been breaking down for a long time. It's not just just uh, recently. Like I said, Goodman wrote this book, I think, in 1975, uh, documenting a lot of his failures. Uh, you could also go online uh, and look at the website of the Fraser Institute in Canada, F-R-A-S-E-R. Um, it might be Fraser.org, I'm not sure, but you, you can find it. And they publish every year a list of waiting lists on, in, in uh, Canadian healthcare. And ca Canadian healthcare is nationalized, of course, also. And uh, inevitably, what you do when you make something free is you, you explode the demand for it. And with the explosion of demand, that would normally push up the price through the roof. And so, you, inevitably, you have to, the government has to impose price controls as a response. And the price controls always create shortages because if you push the price down when you have an explosion of demand, you have even more demand than the original explosion of demand. But at the same time, you make it uneconomical to supply as much because you're holding down the price. So you create shortages. And so governments have to decide how, how to allocate those shortages. And um, they do it by waiting lists primarily in Canada. And so you can look at uh, the Fraser Institute's publication on the, it's, it's called Waiting Your Turn. It comes out every year. And you'll see some things as uh, if you need uh, open heart surgery, it might take two weeks to see a, a doctor. And then the time between seeing the doctor and getting surgery might be another month, something like that. Uh, whereas that doesn't exist in the United States to, to any degree like that. My own father had very serious open heart surgery and. Uh, uh, I was with him at the doctor's office and where, he, where his doctor told him he needed the surgery. And his doctor said, we can do it tomorrow. Or uh, if it's not that extreme a hurry, we can do it two or three days from now. This was at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center. And so uh, we don't really have that problem now, but we will if we have uh, nationalized health care, if Obama care turns into nationalized health care, because that's, that's what happens. You explode the demand by making it free Although, of course, it's not free. We pay for it with taxes. And then uh, the government inevitably puts price controls on, uh, which creates shortages of all kinds. Now, let's see. What else can I read? Media. Billy Baru. In the security chapter, Hayek stated one problem of the people who want to trade freedom for security is those people want everything to everything to do this. Do you think we can set up little Jonestowns throughout the nation for, the, for those people? Oh, I'll leave that up to you, Billy Brewer. That can be your project. Uh, uh, give them minimum subsistence. Okay. Okay, Grayson comes through once again. He puts on the, uh, uh, the link to uh, socialized health care. Oh, what is Maureen saying here? Do I believe the federal government could wither on the vine if most of the states begin to nullify the laws and regulations? Uh, no, I don't see any withering on the vine. Uh, I think nullification has to be the first step to full-fledged secession. 
in the breakup of the American empire into what Thomas Jefferson thought would happen in uh, seven or eight or 10 or 50 different uh, republics, however many, hopefully a few of them would be uh, republics based on classical liberalism and would be a showcase for the world of how to live in a, in a freer society uh, and, and not have the tax burden of 150 military bases in a police state that attempts to run the world. Uh, and I think uh, a demonstration project like that would be so, so tremendous. Uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine who recently established uh, residence in Switzerland is a wealthy guy who uh, purchased citizenship in Switzerland, which you can do. Uh, you negotiate with the, the local government. And he, he told me that his top tax, his top tax rate, including all taxes from any level of government is about one fifteen percent, one five, fifteen percent. And almost all of it, he said, goes toward the local streets, street cleaning, the local sewage treatment, and things that he thinks actually can make the case that he actually benefits from. Uh, and, he, and he said, luckily for me, he's my Swiss friend, uh, I don't have to pay taxes to support an international military empire that exists in over 100 countries. Uh, good point. But if, with, with acts of secession, we could have little Switzerland's here in North America. Uh, and, and have not just this one odd example uh, in Europe, we could have many examples. And so uh, I think that's the way the government can be tamed, if it ever can be tamed, in addition to nullification, uh, if, if, the, if the sheeple can ever be woken up and uh, su become supportive of that. Let's see. Austrian school seems to imply booms and busts can exist without central banks. Yes, they, they can, monetary expansion can create booms and busts, but uh, government policy uh, usually has, uh, almost always has something to do with it. Uh, under, under a gold standard, uh, if, if a bank uh, expands its paper money supply excessively, uh, there's a self-correcting mechanism. Uh, there'll be a run on the bank because inflation will occur and people will uh, will understand that their, their currency is becoming worth less and less. And that bank, well, uh, because it has a bank run on it, will go bankrupt. If it, if it, it, because it, by definition, it, it, it issued more currency than it has in reserve. Uh, but uh, with our, our existing system of fractional reserve banking, there are all sorts of things governments can do without having a, a formal central bank that can allow governments to, or banks rather, to expand the money supply. And American history is full of examples of uh, government policy doing just that. Let's see, I'll read down the list here. Uh, Bob Shaw, given 1975 nationalized health care is known effects, why is it being presented as a solution to health care? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I, I think the, the real answer is that the people who advocate this, they're, they're not really about improving health care. Uh, they, they're about uh, controlling us. They want control over us. I think there was a video that was on, on the web of uh, one of the more odious members of Congress saying just this. Who was it? It was one of the older members of Congress uh, who said, effect, if I can recall it, effectively, we need to control the people. It was one of the old old Democrats who's been in Congress for, for way too long. But uh, he sort of let the cat out of the bag there. And I think uh, that's the prime motivation of the Obamas in the world. Because, you know, once they, they nationalize health care, they're going to say, okay, you're overweight. Uh, if you're overweight, you might, you're more susceptible to uh, heart disease and so forth. That'll impose a burden on the National Health Service. Therefore, we need, the government needs to put you on a mandatory treadmill workout in a, in a, in a, in a government-improved diet or something like that. Maybe they'll hire social workers to make sure you're doing your workouts. Uh, and so once you go down the road to nationalize health care, the government will make the case that, that your whole lifestyle, everything you consume, what you do, how active you are, is its business. And it has a right to control you because, after all, your behavior will affect the rest of society. That's the argument they will make. And they understand that perfectly well. Once they, the government controls health care, it can control everything you do uh, to the best it can anyway. And so that's why it is uh, so totalitarian, and that's why so many of these people are for it. Uh, I think I said earlier, uh, the reason why most people who are in politics get in politics as a career is they have this compulsion to, to control other people. Some of us don't have that compulsion. Some, some people do. 
And the ones that do, that's where they, that's where they go. They get into politics because uh, they want to control other people and they want to use the levers of political power to control us. Uh, can you tell us more about the example of the Soviet Union secession? Any reading for it? Um, uh, read uh, the, the Mises Institute published a book, uh, uh, Secession, Economy, and State, I believe is the title, edited by David Gordon. A book of readings on secession that occurred you know, right, right at the time, right shortly after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So that's one thing to read. Um, there are some videos out there. Uh, look, look for the videos on uh, secession in Lithuania. Uh, there's an acquaintance of mine from Lithuania who, uh, who was uh, showing this video at a conference I was at, and you can, uh, you can get a good idea. In fact, you might even try. I, I, there might be videos about all the for many of the former Soviet republics. You can just, you know, Google it and see see what you come up with. But I know of those videos. But I would recommend the uh, uh, Secession, State, and Liberty. Uh, Grayson found the book. That's the, the title of the book. And uh, you might also go. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Donald Livingston, who just retired from Emory University, runs something called the Abbeville Institute. A B B E V I L L E. Abbeville Institute. And uh, the focus is on research on the decentralization of governmental power. And uh, you might check out their website uh, because he has had a few speakers from the for former Soviet Union, including my old friend Yuri Maltsev, uh, to participate in one of his conferences. And so you might find some resources there on, on the Soviet Union and, and the breakup. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Abbeville, the Abbeville Institute about Southern Pride. No, you know nothing about it. Uh, just go on their website and read what they say, and you'll know that that's not true. Do you think most politicians don't have good intentions? Uh, uh, well, I'm not a mind reader, but uh, I can observe their behavior, and they do have this compulsion to control us. And so uh, if they had good intentions when they get there, they're quickly corrupted by special interest groups, and their intentions inevitably turn into a plot to benefit those people who keep them in power, the special interest groups, uh, that is invariably against the masses, against the taxpayers, uh, for the most part. And so I can observe their behavior, but I can't uh, read their minds as far as that goes. Let's see if we have time maybe for one more that I can talk about. Uh, yes, I think the end justifies the means. Let's see, they had a conference about why Southern literature is great. Uh, no, they did not. Uh, they had a conference about Southern literature. Uh, they didn't necessarily say it's great, but they say it's been swept under the carpet and that, uh, and that the uh, um, authors, mostly from New England, have been made out to be the great heroes of American literature. And there are a lot of great, uh, great, lot, a lot of great literature from Southern authors that hasn't been studied. So they had a conference about this uh, literature that uh, some of the literary experts from the University of Virginia and elsewhere who are associated with the Abbey, Abbeville Institute uh, said uh, is worth reading. And, and even if they said it's great, so what? You know, what's, what's wrong with reading great literature no matter where it comes from? Okay, uh, like I said, if you're interested in the Abbeville Institute, read their website. Uh, don't listen to rumors about people who don't like them because they're in the South. There's a, a one group of Americans where it's okay to be uh, to be bigoted against is, is Southerners uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I guess our time is about up. I know Grayson is probably itching to read some more from the Road to Serfdom, and I'm itching to get out of this hot room here at the Mises Institute on the third floor. And uh, thank you all for uh, for attending once again. And uh, I've been enjoying doing this. And uh, I'm teaching a new course in the fall by the way, called The Political Economy of War. And um, I'll be putting the syllabus out on the web in a few days uh, via Grayson. So uh, have a good evening and have a good day back there in uh, the outback in Australia. And take care.